Well, good evening, everybody. While we're waiting uh, for everybody to register, I'd like to welcome you to our to, to, uh, to tonight's um, webinar, which will, of course, be uh, broadcast nationally. Um, so I'm really delighted to have a number of people on our panel tonight, and I'll introduce them more formally very shortly. Well, of course, we've got Drew, and we've got uh, Peter Reed and Stephen as well. We have a sponsor who would like to, us to mention that with Father's Day coming up, um, you are welcome to go to duckscollection.com and purchase a Father's Day gift. Uh, we were very pleased to have Ducks sponsor our Mother of the Year Awards. So once again, um, they're saying to us that they've got some wonderful products for fathers, um, for those that want to indulge in a gift for their dads, granddads, or fathers, and so on. Well, a bit of advertisement. Our next webinar will be on the 13th of September. We've got an excellent panel of speakers, and we're going to talk about the church, uh, the future of the church. And these people have come together, and it'll be a one-day webinar from 8.30 till 1.30 p.m. on the 13th of September. Please go to the Family Voice website and register. Um, it's going to be one of one, one of the best webinars and uh, conferences, I call them virtual conferences, that you'll hear uh, from these wonderful national and notable speakers. Your guest, uh, your host tonight will might be myself as the national webinar host and David DeLima, the South Australian Northern Territory De Director. What we'd like you to do is, um, as the webinar uh, progresses, please feel free to type in some questions and David We'll filter these questions and we'll be asking a Q&A session very shortly. Tonight, of course, as I said, our guest speakers are Peter, Stephen and Drew. I'll introduce them more formally in a moment. But what I'd like to do is just to mention that Family Voice Australia has this, um, um, uh, you know, advocacy for family, for freedom and faith. And of course, tonight's webinar is very much related to freedom. And um, in, in that regard, we do ask you to, to understand that the, that the webinar is addressing the freedom of speech in the academia world. Could I also mention that if there is a blackout, please re-register back in again, because sometimes blackouts do occur. All right, now, before we start, I'd like to introduce David DeLima, who will open up in prayer, and I'm hoping everybody can just sort of bear with us. And David, over to you, please, for a quick opening in prayer. Thank you so much, Greg. And it's a pleasure to open tonight's meeting in prayer as we commit to you, Drew, Stephen, and Peter, as they are all in their own unique way, seeking to enjoy freedom of speech and freedom of association. So, Lord, we commit to you tonight's meeting and we ask that these treasured freedoms of speech and of association will be protected and safeguarded in our culture. Lord, we lament the way in which we seem to have lost so many of these freedoms and we just ask that you will help Family Voice and others especially to work on restoring and protecting them so that we can progress the nation under your hand of blessing. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, um, David. Look, let me sort of kick the, the ball rolling. There is indeed a crisis in Australian universities in terms of free speech. And to give you an example, these are the kind of headlines that I'm seeing in the paper. You know, cancel culture divides students, professors, court finds university have violated free speech rights of Christian fellowship, uh, victims of campus cancel culture. These are happening daily now. And, and we need to be well and truly aware. Here's one, I've, I worked with Mark Vale some time ago, and Mark Vale, here's an example of a cancel culture where he's, um, he was uh, you know, forced to, to forego his position at the University of Newcastle because he was cancel cultured out of the job. Um, an article from Forbes, 2020, the year university surrendered completely to cancel culture. Well, tonight we've got a number of people in academia, but in particular, Professor Peter Reid. But here's another Professor Patrick, as, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, Patrick Parkinson, as you would know. The Tasmanian University Law Review, 
chose referees who said Professor Parkinson's paper should be rejected. They claimed he used offensive terms such as biological female and opposite sex. Talk about cancel culture. In a uh, university in the UK, uh, 24 top universities have promised to defend freedom of speech and said that disagreement is a fundamental part of debate. Uh, and it comes in the wake of the government clampdown on universities which do not actively promote free speech. This is a UK movement. Well, tonight I've got a very honourable man and I know I've been reading about you, Peter, for many years now and I know you've been in and out of court and what have you, but your book, Reef Heresy, which I do actually have in front of me at the moment, and I've read it a number of times, uh, in particular a few chapters, uh, it's interesting that the recent article in the Australian said that science and media doomsdays ignore good news on the reef. I mean, and, and yet you have been a victim of this particular cancel culture. So Peter, oh, uh, what I'd like to do is introduce you formally uh, and hand over to you. And I give you the opportunity now to tell us about your situation, cancel culture at the academia level and what we can do about it. Thank you, Peter. Well, thanks very much. I probably won't go into a huge amount of detail about my own particular situation, but we are in the High Court. I was fired for essentially saying that there are quality assurance problems with Great Barrier Reef science. But I want to talk a little bit more about cancel culture in general and to say that it really isn't anything particularly new, though we are probably at an extreme at the moment. It seems to be an inevitable consequence of the human's um, herding instinct and our sort of need to fit in uh, with a crowd. And, you know, mobs have always been happy to crucify people either metaphorically or literally for being misfits or dissenters or just for telling the truth. Uh, so, you know, the whole thing about peer groups is they tend to reinforce views. It's a positive feedback system and it inevitably pushes a pendulum off in one direction. And in many regards, all of us have been guilty of complicity in this sort of cancel culture by turning uh, a blind eye. Now, of course, the, the present swing of the pendulum, which I think has been going on for a good 60 years, has started in the universities. And now we have a situation where almost every academic in, in, uni in most universities, especially in the humanities department, would be regarded as a, a sort of on the left side of things. They wouldn't be on the conservative side of things. Not necessarily true in engineering schools where I was from, but in addition to that, we've seen the hijack of the whole educate the school education system, which was partly a consequence of what's happened in universities. Universities have a huge um, impact on curricula in education, so there's that uh, second order effect there. And then, of course, we have things like the terrible legislation, like the Australian. 18C and the various state versions of it, which essentially sanction council culture uh, right throughout society. But the real uh, sort of collapse, of what we've seen in the last few years, and it's a bit like the Taliban taking over Kabul in just such a ridiculous amount, short amount of time, has been the effect of social media and its ability to amplify a hundredfold those normal peer groups that occur in, in um, our society. And so the swing back really won't happen until things go completely mad. And I think we've reached that stage now. We need to get to a, one of those moments where people can see that the emperor really doesn't have any clothes. Uh, and I think that the, uh, that sort of peak madness occurs when the other side really loses contact with reality. And they don't seem to realize that there's a huge part of the population that is against them because that part of the population has decided to self-censor and be silent. So for example, at the university, I remember when uh, Donald Trump won in 2016, and I don't know whether I would have voted for Donald Trump in 2016, but I would have contemplated it. I walked into the common room to have a cup of tea and there was another academic there. Uh, and he started railing about the uh, election result and how could anybody contemplate voting for Donald Trump? What morons, what idiots they were. And I didn't really know what to say. I didn't say, well, I might have voted for Donald Trump. So what did I do? I probably remained silent and beat a retreat. But that particular academic obviously had no idea that there were people in his department 
who were, you know, thought completely different to him. He couldn't see that there must be almost 50% of the population in that, in that boat. So they end up going too far. And I think that an example of this is this trans debate, uh, which has really gone completely crazy. Um, but most of us are even silent on that, especially at universities. And, but we can all see, well, many of us can see that the extreme intolerance that there is, that there is no forgiveness of transgression or errors. Even if you say something silly just by mistake, there is no forgiveness for that. So we can see that we're now turning into this very bleak puritanical world where inevitably everybody is gonna get canceled. Nobody can possibly survive. And we're seeing even the worst, some of the worst culprits, say some of the feminist movements, only some of the feminist movement who have been guilty of cancellation themselves, they are now being canceled for their views, some of them on uh, the trans issue. Um, so we now find ourselves with some un unlikely allies. But I see that there is actually great hope because there was a recent survey of cancel culture and Generation Z, which are apparently the 13 to the 23 year olds, dislike cancel culture more than any other age group, even the baby boomers, the 55 years and over, people like me. The cancel culture, they were against 55% were totally against it. 8% were for it and quite a few of them didn't know what it was, but that was the generation that really doesn't like it the most. And you can see why, because that's a generation that's grown up with social media. They can see that it's just a matter of time before they say something stupid on social media and get canceled themselves. So what can be done, especially in the context of the universities? Well, in my view, the most important thing that needs to be done is that old people need to stand up and get themselves canceled, right? Because we can afford to get canceled. Now, I was canceled for um, saying something about the Great Barrier Reef. I've been saying similar things for 15 years. 15 years ago, I would have been a bit more careful about how I said it because I had a mortgage, I had kids at school, and it would have been a disaster to be fired. But when I was 58, you could afford to take more risks. I have good superannuation, life's good, the kids have left school. What's the problem with being fired when you're 58 or being censured? It's not like Drew Pavlou here, who got cancelled before he was 20 and has had his whole, whole life uh, potentially ruined. So old academics, if you're near 65 years old, you actually have a duty to do something and to take the risks that the young people can't do. If I win in the high court and we get a bit of cash, I'm actually seriously thinking of starting up an organization called Kamikaze Academics. And Kamikaze Academics, main focus would be to issue the Kamikaze Academic of the Year Award. I'm only joking here, well, I'm half joking. And that award would be for an academic who did something noble to get themselves canceled, fired, or majorly censured at a university for doing something noble. Something noble being defined as something that my mum would think was a good thing to do, right? It might be criticizing their local university history department for not uh, talking about Christopher Columbus and James Cook as being good chaps and people we should actually learn about. Or it might be for putting up a, a social media post for saying something really outrageous like boys will be boys, which I sure you agree is, is so problematic on so many levels, like there's obvious um, um, uh, toxic masculinity in that. We're actually saying that boys can't transfer to girls. And there are even other more serious connotations about saying something like boys can be girls. How hard can it be to get yourself fired for university for doing something quite noble? It can't be that hard at all. But you've got to, ac you've got to register as a kamikaze academic beforehand. You can't just go and do it accidentally like I did it. Though that we might have an accidental kamikaze academic of the year of the ward. There would definitely be a second prize though for a failed kamikaze academic. Mm. These would be the people who registered and then didn't get themselves fired. Maybe because they were at the University of Chicago, which has got excellent free speech uh, provisions in, their, in that university. And you can say things which would offend people, really good sort of things. Look, I jest, or at least I half jest, but I think that there is a, there is a, a, there is a point to this. We need to have humor to counter this. Why can't we have kamikaze public servants? Why can't we have 
a thousand um, New South Wales kamikaze um, public uh, servants all put something up on social media and tempt the, uh, the government to fire all of them in one go. Wouldn't it be so much fun uh, to do that with a little bit of humour? But I must say, I am optimistic. I can see that the pendulum has started to swing back. But what we need to do, and the older people in particular, we need to take some risks and help push it back in the right direction. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you, Peter. Excellent introduction to the topic. We're going to get into a Q&A, but we'll listen to the other two. What I'd like to do now is um, I'd like to introduce Drew now. Drew Pavlow, now, we've all been reading about you, and I thought this would be an appropriate slide. Um, Peter referred to you that you've been cancelled before, you know, still in your, your early years. But here are the headlines that I've been looking at, uh, Drew, you know. Drew Pavlov banned from IQ, uh, UQ campus, uh, reject student uh, appeal. Uh, you've been suspended. Drew, it's a hard gig, I've, I've got to tell you. Now, you tell us how and why and what we can do about this cancel culture from the uh, student point of view. Thank you, Drew. Mm. No, thank you. Thank you for the invite. Um, see, the interesting thing is if I had, if I could go back in that time machine, back to me two and a half years ago, um, I would be absolutely shocked that I'd be appearing on a panel like this <laughs> because I started out, um, you know, as a very lefty sort of university student and I was coming to the protests um, against the Chinese government um, from a human rights perspective. So I, the thing that was outraging me was the brutalization of Hong Kong students, the brutalization of 1 million Muslims in concentration camps in Western China. That was the thing that was shocking to me. And, um, and I went to this um, in a way that I felt was still consistent with what were at my times kind of left-leaning sort of views. Like, I mean, I first got into politics loving the Bernie Sanders 2016 campaign. And, and I mean, I, I was like all on board with all the, you know, the hip um, culture, identity politics stuff on campus. I mean, I would have been a complete, um, I mean, I would have been, a really good goody two shoes when it comes to avoiding cancellation. And um, it's really interesting how I ended up in this position because the response really um, from a lot of people on the left who at the time I thought were allies um, was remarkable. So I protested um, against the Chinese government for its persecution of Muslims, for its persecution of Hong Kongers, Tibetans. Um, and you know, you, you're, that's a, those are favorite causes of like the left. They wanted to be speaking out, they often, speak out um, for human rights, um, Muslims being persecuted, etc. Except when I protested and I spoke out, um, many of them actually took the opposing side. They sort of came to the position that because I was um, a white man, that to criticize the Chinese government must automatically be feeding into Australia's, um, you know, terrible evil history of um, evil racism towards Chinese people. Obviously there has been terrible stuff in the past um, against Chinese people. I mean, you know, lambing flats rights, etc. I'm a student of Australian history. I studied history at UQ before I got expelled. But one human rights protest um, where I actually was assaulted by Chinese nationalists, um, they actually just decided that I was suddenly a fascist. I was a white supremacist. I was a dog whistler, um, that I was trying to inspire hatred and violence towards Chinese people. The Socialist Alternative Club at UQ, they um, told me, you're trying to start a race riot and we won't accept that either stop either never protest again or we will organize protests against your protest like this was the type of response that i received and um it was quite interesting like i i was actually believe it or not um a member of the greens at one point in time um i went to the greens party hoping that someone would support me you know i was supporting muslims in china i was supporting hong kong as being persecuted the Greens Party officially has good stances on these human rights issues. Um, and I asked them, will anyone try and stand up for me when I'm, now the university is coming after me, now they want to expel me because I was protesting and they've got a very close economic relationship with China. And, um, you know, the local state MP for the Greens uh, refused to get involved because it was too, uh, because it was too sensitive. Um, Reed, he had been told that I was this terrible racist or something. So to support me was to support fascism or something like that. Um, I wrote to Penny Wong, 
again, um, believe it or not, at one point in time, I was a member of the Labour Party. I joined as a bright-eyed youth as an 18-year-old thinking, oh, the Labour Party is going to, you know, bring great changes to Australia, great progress. Um, what happened when I wrote to Penny Wong um, asking for the Labour Party to try and support me um, when the university was trying to expel me for simply standing up for human rights? Well, um, ignored for one and a half months and then eventually her chief of staff wrote back saying, oh, we don't take um, positions as a party on internal university disciplinary matters. This is despite the fact that my expulsion was making international news, was covered in the New York Times, was covered um, in international media, was commented on by mem many members of parliament, including some Labour MPs, credit where credit's due, um, Kimberly Kitching in Victoria, she, she was a great support to me. But um, yeah, the Labour Party was like, we don't take um, positions on internal university disciplinary matters. And it, it was just, it was a shocking experience for me to, to um, see that because there was just this knee jerk reaction um, from many people on the left, just a knee jerk reaction of oh, Drew's white, Drew's um, a cishet white male or whatever. So to protest against the Chinese government must automatically be lambing flats 2.0 must be Drew Pavlou leading a race riot on campus, must be trying to organize violence against Chinese students. This is what I've experienced. Um, and to have that type of um, vitriolic abuse hurled in my direction at a time when my family and I were actually receiving death threats from Chinese nationalists, to also have that, and I was also facing, of course, expulsion from the university, to also have all that vitriolic abuse um, sort of piled on me by people I had previously thought were my mates on the left, that was a terrible thing to experience. And, you know, when you're a young person like I am and you're an undergraduate, you don't want to go against the herd. You don't want to go onto campus and think, oh, everyone here thinks I'm racist. Everyone here thinks I'm evil. You don't want to be, as, as Peter said, you know, it's a bit of herd mentality. You don't want to be the person who sticks their out, neck out and is suddenly, you know, abused and all sorts of terrible things are hurled at them. You know, it's quite interesting. I'm a Greek Australian. My family were immigrants um, to Australia. And, you know, a lot of the time when I was growing up, like I got, you know, sometimes I got called like a wog and I got picked on a little bit. And then, and so like, I mean, you know, I had my own sort of experience, um, you know, not, not racism, racism, but like, I mean, I had my own experience sometimes having troubles, I guess, fitting in and everything. And then suddenly people going, Drew's this neo-Nazi white, right, white supremacist race riot leader. That was just a crazy thing to me because, for a lot of my youth, um, I was called a wog and a lot of people said, you're not Australian, you're not an Aussie. And then all of a sudden, oh, Drew's a white supremacist, um, part of the Australian nationalist evil mentality. This is the type of stuff I experienced. So it was just such a shock to experience. And the fact that it was really conservatives who came up and spoke out in my favour, Bob Catter. Um, Bob Catter, I developed a great friendship with him. Um, and he's a bit of an agrarian socialist, so we, we sort of agree on some of the economic stuff, because I, I still have kind of social democratic economic views, but on social issues, I guess I have really turned against, you know, the woke identity politics cancel culture, because my experience of it is, um, it's just brutal. brutal. I'm not sure if um, anyone here is a fan of Tom Holland. I'm a great fan of this historian from Britain, and he's written the book Dominion, and his argument is that all this sort of like cancel culture thing actually perhaps has its roots ultimately in um, the Christian cultural foundation of the West of Western civilization. And he argues that a lot of this cancel culture sort of identity politics work stuff, um, it's like Christianity, but they actually, because obviously these people are atheists and secularists often, they strip away the redemptive factor, they strip away the spirituality, the Christian actual message. And it's just basically about condemnation. And it's just basically about puritanical um, it's just basically a return to puritanical sort of things. And I, I think um, that's probably right. A lot of these people who, um, who you know, they would be woke and they're all in favour of identity politics and cancel culture, et cetera. And, you know, they would be the first to condemn the church and condemn Christianity, et cetera. I mean, they probably don't even realise that a lot of the time um, it's like, they've actually internalized some of the Christian message, but without the actual important aspects, like the redemptive aspects, the spirituality. And so they, it's missing the whole, whole message. So, I mean, they take up the social just, justice message of Christianity, which I guess is really important to the culture of the West, but they actually just lose the entire spiritual spirituality. They don't even realize it. And so for them, it's just Puritanism and it's very brutal. I mean, 
to have that kind of, um, you know, to adopt that worldview where everyone is to be condemned and, you know, we are born. I mean, this is a world view, worldview where, you know, people are born or people have innate sin. Everyone's an innate sinner, um, except there's no redemption in this worldview. So it's just, it's just terrible. Um, so this is kind of what I think we're, we're going through these days. Um, uh, Tom Holland, he's, he's, he's quite persuasive in this argument. I, I think he's probably correct that a lot of these people don't even realize that um, they've, they've internalized a lot of the Christian message regarding social justice and stuff, but by taking away the actual spiritual aspect, without, by taking away the story of Christ, the message of Christ, um, it just basically becomes about condemnation um, and everyone is this terrible sinner that must be, you know, cast out and expelled. My experience with cancel culture is, you know, it's a brutal thing to experience. I wouldn't wish it on really anyone, um, especially, you know, I've, I've lost friends. Um, I was a good friend to Wilson Gavin, a young um, conservative Catholic in Queensland who took his life after being, you know, bullied nationwide after that protest he led against Drag Queen Storytime. You know, regardless of the actual way he went about the protest, I mean, he did not deserve to lose his life up over that. I've, I've really seen how brutal this stuff can be really up, clo up close. People trying to destroy my life. Um, you know, there was a point where I had young labor staffers. Um, so in the initial phases when I was facing expulsion, um, the university had obviously prepared a 200 page expulsion document on me to try and, you know, just piling stuff on me. And, um, and this wasn't public yet at that point, although I had shown it to the ABC, I'd shown it to the Washington Post, I'd shown it to a number of politicians like Senator James Patterson. Um, and all these people had read it and they knew that I was being treated unfairly. But um, a lot of Labor, there were young Labor staffers. Um, and I guess just going back to that first protest that they hated and they dubbed, they dubbed a white nationalist protest, they went around to Labor MPs. And I'm, I know this, but for a fact, because people told me, told this to me, they were going to Labor MPs, don't support Drew Pavlou. The reason he's not making this expulsion document public is because there's rape allegations in it. And that was a complete lie because this was a document that was read by the parliament, that was read by MPs, senators, Washington Post, New York Times, ABC. No one saw anything criminal, but it was just people just piling, piling, piling terrible things on people because they just, they, it's hatefulness. It's hatefulness. They, they construct this strawman type enemy visual of you and they just do anything to try to take you down. I've experienced cancer culture up close. I definitely see what Peter says when he says the Generation Z is really anti-cancel culture. I mean, I'm actually a member of Generation Z, the Zoom as we often say. And um, I really, I really see that. Like, you know, it's it's a funny thing, even among sort of um young lefty Zoomers, there actually is this sort of like new movement that's kind of sprung up across podcasts and stuff like that. And they call themselves the dirtbag left. And I mean, these people are left for the intent, these people are left in to the extent that say they support, you know, public health care in the United States, they support a social democratic economy. But when it comes to like these social, dem so when it comes to these social matters and, you know, these tripwire sort of topics that they try and cancel people on. I mean, they gleefully sort of take joy in offending and like going against the established kind of cancel culture norms. So I, I see this all the time. People my age, um, progressives, who nevertheless, they're, they're sick of cancel culture. Everyone knows it can get them at any time. Um, and the consequences when they are targeted are so brutal. So people are turning against it. I see it personally in my generation. Um, I've experienced what it's like to be cancelled. Um, you know, I'm still here, but, but I mean, it's 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 a tough experience, and I wouldn't wish that on anyone. It's a terrible form of public shaming. The good thing, as Peter says, is I think the tide is starting to turn, and I, I think we will see um, a big, big shift in the coming years, where even among the left and even among progressives and young people, people are sick of the idea that you know you make one small slip up and then you're just to be condemned and discarded and destroyed for all time people are sick of this thank you drew thank you so much we're going to come back to you with some question time sure. um what i'd like to do now is um introduce stephen now stephen I'm, I'm i'm going to refer to you as a as a, a as a person with rational thought and 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 somebody that really understands that cancel culture has to change. Uh, you've written for The Australian, you're an academic, 
you're, you're right in the thick of it. Stephen, can you take us through your experience of why this cancel culture within academia, but in general, has to stop or change and what we can do about it? Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously it needs to stop because in a, in a liberal democracy, <clears throat> you don't destroy people's reputations and careers for making contributions to public debate uh, that might uh, ruffle some people's feathers. But I want to look at this a bit more broadly and, and, and point out a, a shift that's taken place, particularly over the last 15, 15 years. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, uh, when people might have spoken about sort of offered conservative views on something like immigration or same-sex marriage or any number of, of, of controversial topics, often those who, who, would, who wanted them shut down would, would, uh, would accuse them of being offensive. They'd say, you know, what you've said is offensive. Um, in the last sort of 10 years, the, the language of offence I've noticed has actually declined. And what's starting to take its place is not so much people saying that you're offensive, uh, is people saying your words are harmful. Your words are actually causing harm. And that's actually a pretty good strategic move on behalf of those who don't like freedom of speech. Because just saying that someone's words are offensive, well, doesn't really mean anything. Just because someone's offensive doesn't mean that they've broken the law or, or, any, or, or that they're necessarily anything other than someone who might be a bit socially oblivious or something like that. But saying that someone's words are harmful, that they're actually um, complicit in harming other people, at that point, the person who, is, who has uttered those allegedly harmful words is by definition morally wrong. And also, uh, this is something that involves potentially governing authorities as well, because why do we have governments, if not to prevent one citizen harming another citizen? So one thing that we want to really notice is the shift in language from offence to harm. And when, when people sort of say, you know, your words are harmful, or your words are making people feel unsafe, what they're doing is they're putting you into a box whereby you're bordering on criminal uh, behavior. And we want to notice the point I'm making is when people say your words are harmful, notice it and call it out. And you can say, no, 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 my words are not harmful. Uh, you may not like what I'm saying. There are some people whose feelings may be hurt by what I'm saying, but that's a far cry from saying that what I'm saying is harmful. And so we want to be very, very uh, careful uh, when people make those accusations. Let me give you a case in point just to sort of bring this home. There's a case right now in Melbourne, uh, a Melbourne academic, uh, Holly Lawford Smith. Uh, Lawford Smith is one of Australia's top political philosophers, and she was recently targeted by colleagues and transgender rights activists for launching a website encouraging women to report personal stories showing how transgender ideology has adversely affected them. The, her, her colleagues and, and other academics in other universities uh, published an open letter signed by 1,400 university staff, which doesn't exactly bode very well for the future of freedom of speech in universities in some ways, basically saying that the university needs to take, quote, swift action, end quote, against her. Um, now, when you read this open letter, and it's still available on the internet, you can, you can find it. Uh, when you look at the argument against what Holly Smith is talking about, all Holly Smith was saying was basically, look, uh, these sort of transgender rights are not necessarily a picnic for women. Women find themselves uh, in women's only places with biological men. It doesn't necessarily make them feel unsafe. Uh, and, 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 and other things that she's, she said that actually, again, you know, um, 10 years ago, no one would have batted an eyelid uh, unless you worked in a gender studies department. Uh, but when you read the, the argument against her in this letter drafted by academics, um, you know, the word, the word safe and unsafe are mentioned four times in the argument against her, and the word harmful is mentioned three times. So they're basically saying her words make people unsafe, her words are harmful. And so what I'm, what I'm pointing out here is what, what we might call therapeutic cancel culture. There are all sorts of kinds of, of cancel culture. Uh, what Drew experienced is one kind, what Peter experienced is another kind, but this is therapeutic cancel culture. It's when people's career, when people try to destroy people's reputations and careers, uh, with the accusation that their words have caused sort of medical psychological harm to a group of people. Um, 
And it's definitely where we're sort of slipping into. You can not just see it in the universities, you see it in the Victorian uh, uh, gay conversion therapy legislation, where it talks about, you know, um, certain words that you might say, certain, um, you know, suggesting that someone uh, can change their sexuality or something like that. It refers to these, as, these words as, as harmful. So again, therapeutic cancel culture, which is what, you know, we're, is happening sort of what was, what they tried to do to Professor Lawford Smith at, at Melbourne University, but we're sort of seeing it quite a bit around us. It's the idea of cancelling people's careers because their words are harmful, usually to other people's mental health. And it's usually around issues of sexuality, uh, transgenderism. So that's the kind of thing uh, that we sort of uh, need to be looking out for. It's not a surprise that this sort of thing has crept up because the fact of the matter is that modern society has a mental health epidemic uh, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, some researchers actually uh, link the mental health epidemic with the decline of religion. And that, that's, a, that's a very interesting link uh, uh, to make. Uh, Erica Commissar, uh, an American researcher, makes that link. Uh, so there's certainly a mental health epidemic. But, you know, an excellent book on this sort of thing is Carl Truman's Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And so another thing that's going on that's leading to this therapeutic cancel culture is the, the absolute centralization uh, to, uh, of modern notions of who I am, of, of sexuality, and also just my feelings. And so when you say things that um, sort of make people's feelings hurt, you know, maybe 70 years ago, someone would have said, oh, you said something that hurt my feelings and sort of moved on. Nowadays, if you say something uh, that, that really hurts someone's feelings, maybe about... about um, maybe about their sexuality, you might say, look, you know something, I don't think uh, gay marriage is real marriage. Um, again, something that, you know, 10 years ago, um, quite frankly, you know, you had, you had Julia Gillard, Kevin Rudd, Penny Wong saying that, that, that sort of thing, um, you know, 10, 12 years ago. Now, that cuts straight, people feel like you've sort of put a dagger in their heart, it feels like almost violence against them because so central to people's identity now is their sexuality. Uh, Carl Truman brings out, so a whole bunch of cultural changes that are taking place and coming to a head right now, leading not to sort of, not just the sort of therapeutic cancel culture, but, but a society uh, that is increasingly uh, becoming almost a sanitarium or sort of a hospital, sort of where basically governments are making more and more decisions for us based on, uh, based on sort of health. Uh, it's limiting our freedoms more and more based on health, limiting our, our freedom of speech more and more based on health. Goodness knows in this COVID atmosphere, we can see uh, that sort of thing happening. And this is something that thinkers and academics and historians and philosophers have been saying is coming uh, for well over 100 years. You know, just finally, a good project for someone out there would be to examine free speech codes in all the Australian universities. Now, I know something like that has been done, and, and you've got the French report, which says some very good things, but a very good uh, project would be look at the free speech codes and see to what extent uh, universities say, yeah, yeah, we believe in free speech unless it's harmful or unless it makes people feel unsafe. Because in a society in which just saying things that are controversial about particularly sexuality and, and other things, I suppose, like culture, religion, saying something that's controversial is considered saying something uh, that is harmful then it's going, to be, it's going to be natural that a lot of university students and staff members and, and administrators in universities are going to feel, I'm unsafe in this environment. There's that person walking around saying all sorts of things that make me feel really, really unsafe. This is an unsafe environment. And so when you have in the bylaws of universities, uh, like you do at Melbourne University, actually, um, limits to free speech saying, well, free speech is limited by, you know, speech that makes people unsafe or that, or that, or, or that is harmful, at that point, the free speech laws become very, very fragile indeed. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess my contribution to this is just to, to, to notice that particular twist that has taken place lately. Words not so much being offensive, but words being harmful. And, and we need senior academics, yes, like Professor Peter, uh, uh, Peter Ridd, we need uh, we need senior administrators to actually stand up and say, no, these words might be, you might be offended, you, your feelings might be hurt, but you have not been harmed by these words. So please stop trying to criminalize this 
this person's behavior. And, you know, that takes courage. And, and, and I honestly do think, I don't think there's any magic bullet for, for cancel culture. I can't claim to be as optimistic as other people here on this panel, but I do think if there is any kind of uh, solution to cancel culture, it's what, um, it's courage culture. It's, it's, it is people, it is senior academics standing up and taking a bullet so everyone over time can see how oppressive and tyrannical and just ridiculous this whole this whole trend is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. That's uh, a very good um, overview, and I appreciate that. Now, we're going to go to questions in one moment, but I'll kick it off while David gets the first question ready. Um, look, it, you know, a question. Is it the fact that a lot, lot of us speak out about council culture and we and we oppose it? But could there be an argument that we're not speaking out loud enough? Um, any comments, Peter, Drew, or Stephen? Hmm. Uh, yeah, well, I, I mean, that's essentially what what I've been saying. That hmm. uh, and that there's really one class of people who are in the best position for it. And, and as Stephen said, it is the older academic. It is, it is the older people. It's the older public servants. It's the older everybody hmm. who can afford to get themselves cancelled. And yes, I think courage culture is probably a really good word that yeah. Stephen used there. Yeah. People, things don't happen when people keep capitulating. People mm. need to stand up. And some of us stand up by accident, um, but there's going to need to be a bit more deliberate standing up uh, for that by other people as well. Thank you, Peter. David. Yes, thanks, Craig. Uh, I'd like to ask one question of all of our participants tonight. So we'll start off uh, inviting Peter Ridd to answer the question. Universities in the 1960s and 70s were bastions of dissent, protest, and the free expression of ideas. Why now are universities shutting down politically incorrect expression and assembly? Peter? Well, I'm not sure they actually were the bastions that we might hope they were, but they were certainly way better than they are now. Now, it's just all these... Um, these, these self-reinforcing um, attributes of the herd mentality that we, the culture drifts in one direction and it's just happened very, very slowly and nobody's tried to push it back until essentially in the last couple of years. Uh, that's why it's happened, I think, but mm. it's a very good question. Mm. Uh, Drew, what do you think is driving this change? I realise the 60s and 70s uh, are in the dim dark, dark ages in your in your uh, grandparents' memory, possibly. But uh, why do you think there's been this change? Uh, certainly, my experience as a student on campus was uh, the university was very strongly uh, politically incorrect, very keen to express ideas and have dissent and protest. Drew, yeah. Look, I think one part of it is um, the commercialization, possibly, of universities. So. I guess there was all there was for a long time, and it's almost even an ancient idea now. But the university had its roots in, like you know, Christian. Um, I mean, it, it the university was conceived on Christian lines, and and for a long time, it there was this idea that there was there was, there was an idea that students and scholars were searching for for a transcendent truth, and I think in recent decades, it's really become. Um, about vocation, everything is about um, churning out graduates who will meet, you know, the KPI criteria, and you know, academics are now subject to um, like student review policies, and the student is now a consumer rather than someone engaged with a scholar, you know, in the search for transcendent knowledge. So, I think possibly, for me at least, I think part of it is. The commercialization of the universities and I think that's some, a broader trend that's happened across the culture um like the, there's a good book on this deaths of despair and it's it's written by American academics and they really argue that the decline of um the decline of church going the decline of um neighborhood associations the decline of um union membership even um all this has led to this kind of hollowing out of civil society and all these and it's all sort of been underpinned by this doggy dog kind of um, economic competition. It's like this idea that we're all um, radically isolated individuals and that we're, we're in competition with one another to obtain the most resources. And those at the top, um, I mean, it's an inversion of the, um, of, 
Christ's message, right? Christ said, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And in our culture, I think, um, you know, the very, very top, they're the ones who are seen as the geniuses and, you know, the billionaires are the geniuses. They're, they've got there by their own initiatives while the poor are, you know, lazy or stupid or uneducated. So I think there's been this inversion in our culture and okay. mm. yeah. And I, I think it's just that commercialization it's happening all across the co the society, but um, we've lost the search for transcendent values because it's now just about churning out graduates, um, meeting KPIs, meeting, meeting government set criteria, et cetera. Okay. And Stephen, your view on why the change of university culture? Well, I think, um, I think uh, sort of older leftists, uh, older leftists are a little bit uh, nostalgic about uh, the 1960s and the 1970s and the love of freedom of speech. I mean, the ba Baroness, uh, Baroness Cox in England, she was a, a sort of a, a conservative Christian sociology lecturer. Her lectures were interrupted by sort of Marxist leftists of the 60s. Um, it's also, and you know, they, 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 they routinely, uh, you know, described uh, conservative lecturers at their universities as fascists and as people whose ideas um were basically oppressive and i guess my point is is that where does modern cancel culture come from well there's a lot of sources but ideologically it actually does come out of the new left of the 1960s and the 1970s so you know here we have the the new left reader published in 1968 i have a, a first edition here uh, and in this book you have an essay by herbert marcuse a very famous uh, new left writer who wrote an essay called repressive tolerance and in this essay he basically argued look you can't tolerate all views. You can't tolerate views that undermine social equality. And so if someone's uh, saying something that, underma that undermines social equality, uh, then that is a view that should not be tolerated. Well, that's exactly, in a sense, what people are saying nowadays. You, know, you can't say that because this is victimizing and undermining the equality of this whole particular identity group. And so when, when sort of older leftists look back on the 60s and 70s and say, oh, there was some golden age of freedom of speech there, well... I'm a little bit more cynical. I'm a bit more cynical about that. Um, I, and I think out of actually those new left ideas that they all learned at university, a lot of the, ide the ideology from cancel culture actually does emerge. I mean, it was essentially a Marxist movement, the 1960s and 70s, it was essentially a Marxist movement. And Marx was not a tolerant man you know, for Marxism. If you're not a Marxist, then you're counter-revolutionary. Then, then you're actually, uh, just unplug that speaker though, then you're actually um, harmful uh, to the underclass, and those views, therefore, uh, need to be repressed, which is you know, all about what Marxism is. And so it's not a surprise that as the new left sort of evolved in the 80s and 90s, sort of took on postmodernism and, and took on more gender and sexuality and that kind of thing, it's not a surprise um, that you've got you know, this modern cancel culture, although just very quickly, Peter Ridd, you're absolutely right. You cannot, you cannot discount technology in all of this. Why are people canceling other people? Well, because they can. <laughs> well done. Okay, a question for Peter. Uh, what is the purpose of a university in relation to free speech? Well, it just should make sure that it exists within the university. That, that's really it. I mean, if you can't have free speech, uh, freedom of ideas, free to, freedom to express those ideas and to argue those ideas and take them wherever they're going to go, if you can't have them at a university, where on earth can you have them? And that's why it's so dis disagreeable when you see that the, the centre of the, of the cancel culture and the loss of free speech has actually started in the very place that it should exist most. Okay, uh, Drew. Will we see a further erosion of freedom of expression and freedom of association before things improve? Will they improve? I mean, that's that's the million dollar question. Will things improve? Will things get worse before they improve? <sighs> Gee, I mean, obviously, I hope that they get better and <laughs> the situation um, improves itself. But it, it's it's going to be very difficult. Um, someone asked a question here, you know, why have we lost that desire for the pursuit of the transcendental? And, you know, it's a process centuries in the making. Like over many centuries, our society has like turned away from spiritualism and the quest for God. And it's, it's we've turned towards hedonism and materialism and hyper-individualism. So it's like, how do you reverse those centuries long 
cultural changes. It's a very hard thing. And look, I think there's something to Stephen's argument when he, you know, when he's quite cynical and says, you know, I don't know if things are are going to improve. It's tough. It's really tough. Yeah. Uh, question for Peter. The University of Chicago, you mentioned, is a academically free university. How have they achieved that? And are there any universities in Australia which are academically free? Well, it was achieved in University of Cargo simply because of the, well, I'm not sure what they call the vice chancellor over there, but the head of the university, basically, that's what he wanted and that's what he got. And I think even the, um, the successor has carried that on. Um, in Australia, yes, there are examples. I think the university, I can't remember whether it's University of Sydney or the University of New South Wales has actually gone further than the French Review uh, recommendations. So there are, there are some um, encouraging signs within Australia, but there are other universities which are really backwards. And what's happened to Holly Lawford Smith at University of Melbourne is an absolute total disgrace. And this comes after you know, the new legislation that the federal government has in introduced just in March this year, which should protect Holly Lawford Smith. But University of Melbourne is, is ignoring that. It's an absolute disgrace. And sooner or later, there's got to be fines of universities if they don't carry out proper freedom of, of uh, speech at the university. They should just lose their ticket as a university and that would actually start to concentrate their minds a little bit. Hmm. I think uh, Sydney University yeah. declined to receive funding from mm. the Ramsey Foundation for mm. teaching of the course yeah. in Western civilization. So that's a problem. Yeah, um, just, I think I'll, also... Oh, I'll just quickly note as well, um, under... The, under the recent vice chancellor, they um they refused to host the Dalai Lama on campus due to their close ties with the Chinese mm. government. So it is tough. It's tough. Mm. Yeah. A question for Stephen: Can online universities commence which cannot be controlled by council culture? Um, as long as you have, as long as you have a board of a university or a learning institution that. Uh, truckles to cancel culture mobs, then whether a university is online or whether it's in person uh, is irrelevant. A, a lot of it really is up to the board uh, and the governance of a university. It's, and, and that's, that's really where it lies. And if you have an institution where they basically just say, well, look, that's your opinion, but in actual fact, this is a, a good academic and they haven't said anything um, really wrong, uh, then, then you'll be fine. You, 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 know, you won't be cancelled in, in the sense of having your job, um, it, losing your job. But if you have a, a board that, that is obsessed with PR and is worried and sort of mistakes, sort of a gaggle, a gaggle of, 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 of cancel, sort of a gaggle of Twitter cancellers, mistakes them for the general public and, and for the average person who wants to study, then no, uh, anywhere you go, you're, you're liable to fall victim. And which is why you need people on boards and other academics standing up with the courage to say, no, this is not right. Hmm. A quick okay, question, yeah. uh, we've come to the end very shortly, but I, I noticed overseas, there's actually um, a university cancel culture index available. Um, is, there a, is there an argument to have a free speech university index where we can have the most uh, cancel culture university at the top and then the most, uh, you know, open university down. Uh, in other words, what I'm saying is that that might decide which students go to which university. If you're going to be cancelled, why go to a, a university that, as David said, was meant to be the last bastion of free speech? So is there an argument for some sort of university index? Uh, a quick yes or no? Um, you first, Stephen, then Peter, and then Drew. Yeah, there's an argument for it, but I actually don't know how many students would actually care about it. That's the thing. Um, we, we, we shouldn't think that people care about this as much as we do. And I think actually something like that may already exist in America. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a, it's a good idea. Uh, maybe, though, it's, it's probably more for other academics yep. uh, than it is for students. Okay. Thank you. Peter? I agree totally with Stephen. The students don't usually care too much no. until it affects them, like Drew. <laughs> um, but it um, would be most useful for academics. 
And in fact, I think the IPA has sort of done something similar uh, along those lines, but I think it's an excellent idea mm. for Pete, for them to be held account in that manner. Excellent. Joe, quick. Yeah, I would echo both Stephen and um, Peter in that I don't think most students would care. Honestly, in my experience, most students actually don't even really get involved that much in politics. Mm. It's, okay. there's, a, there's a very vocal activist minority, but I think most people at, for example, the University of Queensland are really just there to get a qualification for a job, that type of thing. Thank you, Drew. David DeLima, could you close in prayer and then I'll finish off. Thank you. Yes, Lord, we commit to you the trajectory that these three fine men have taken to themselves. We pray especially for Peter Red's High Court case that justice will be done. Uh, be with Drew as he's uh, regrouping in his academic work after this enormous setback and be with Stephen in his work in academia. So, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to have heard from these three. We pray for family voice as we consider how we might uh, progress matters in regard to further freedom of speech and of association and assembly. And so be with us all, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Drew, Peter and yes. Stephen. This, is, this has been recorded. It will be available in about a week. Um, may I thank you on behalf of all our uh, national supporters, and we've got, uh, you know, around about 100,000 on our database. Um, but may I just say that, look, it's important that we share our, our opinions without having to be cancelled. And I think we're very fortunate to still live in a country where we can express our freedom of uh, expression. So thank you very much. Uh, I value what you've said, and I'm sure on behalf of the governing board of Family Voice Australia, we thank you um, and wish you well and hope to join you once again, but please keep up the kamikaze work there, Peter. <laughs> Good night Thanks. to everybody. God bless. Thanks so much. Good night. Thank you very much.